Okay, so uh, let's just uh, spend a, a minute uh, going back to this idea that uh, all of the energy is tied into um, the front and the back door. How many people are familiar with that terminology? The front door and the back door. The system has a front door, the system has a back door. So that's actually a very accurate description um, in terms of what's going on. Um, but um, how, do we, how do we measure the rate at which kids are coming into the system? Cases per month? Compared to prior years is a good, uh, good use of baseline. Kids per thousand. That's the one I was looking for. So that's basically, there's a group of children who are at risk of placement, and they enter the system at a certain rate, and it's a rate per thousand is a good way to calculate that. What about, um, uh, and so when I say all of the energy is tied up in that dynamic, can you think about all of the things you're doing in your county right now today, workers are doing right now at this very moment that are tied to that rate? All the decisions, driving to a neighborhood to talk to a family is about that rate and affecting that rate. It's important to hold on to that because that's where the link to the outcomes is. What's the outcome? If you're running a good child welfare system, we were just talking about um, some examples. In one place, they have a placement rate of six per thousand. In another place, they have a rate of two and a half per thousand. They have different rates. Now, there's a lot that we would need to know to know whether or not the six, point, the six per thousand versus the 2.5 per thousand is the right number or is a better number or represents a quality program or not a quality program. There's a lot that needs, uh, we need to know about that. But, but at the end of the day, the folks that are running the system with a rate of six per thousand, what are they trying to do? Trying to reduce the rate. Too many kids going into foster care, all things being equal. We would all be a lot better off if families uh, were in shape, uh, in the kind of shape needed to, to be able to raise their kids at home with additional help from the, from the public uh, service sector or the private sector, as the case may be, um, uh, to the extent that doing so would prevent that child from needing to be placed into foster care. That's what we mean by preventive services. And we have to figure out a way to measure that. So the rate per thousand is a good place to start when we talk about linking outcomes to finance. So if we're actually successful in preventing a placement, what happens? Kid doesn't go into foster care. You save money by not placing the kid into foster care. It's very simple. I told you it was extremely simple to make this link. Okay? Uh, we then have exits from the system. Children in, uh, children in, in care. Um, again, Back to the question of energy and all of the energy in the system being devoted now, uh, or at least divided between the front door and the back door, we're now talking about the back door. What do we do to change uh, exits? What's a, what's a way to describe exits from the system? Those are types of exits. I want something that gives me the quantity. Timeliness to adoption gets closer. Length of time in care is linked to the exit rate. How many people right now can think about stuff that's going on at their agency that's about reducing time in care? Everybody. Everybody's got something going on that is working to reduce that length of time in care. The variation in the United States in average length of time in care goes from four months to about 28 months. That is an unbelievable amount of variation in the rate at which kids are leaving the system. Unbelievable variation. 
That's an unbelievable amount of money going into the state that gets 28 months on average versus four months on average. Just if you just think about the money that's tied to that difference. Now, do we know whether or not the state that has a four-month median length of stay is a better state, is, a, is, is running a better program than the one that's operating at 28 months uh, median? Uh, sadly, we don't. And that's, that's part of our problem as a, as a, um, as a field of practice, that we, we can't speak to the fact that we would like to get the number, the 28 number down, but do we want to get it all the way down to four? We just, we don't know. We don't know what the right number is. So we've got to work on that. So how do you, how do you get that number down? You discharge planning, concurrent, act, concurrent planning, uh, expedited, somebody talked about adoption, expediting adoption. Think of all the stuff that was in uh, ASFA that was related to getting kids out of foster care. Virtually nothing in ASFA about keeping kids out of the foster care system, by the way, including the federal performance measures. Is there a pre federal performance measure on the child welfare system related to admissions per thousand of kids coming into care? No. So how do you actually have a performance management system that doesn't manage, doesn't ask you to manage the one, one half of the things you actually can manage to run a better system? They do not care one bit about that in the federal performance system. There is not a measure that says compare counties or states on rate per thousand. And yet, as I said, it's one of the two things or one of the three things if you count strategies that work both ends at the simultaneously. It's one half of the things that you can do to manage your system and they don't care at all about it. That's an editorial aside. The point being that uh, exits per unit time, a discharge rate, combined with an entry rate will produce a population over time. So when we look at our admission rate per thousand, that's the link to outcomes. Our discharge rate per thousand, that's our link to outcomes. We're trying to influence that. If you run a system with a constant rate of discharge, and you, cu uh, you couple that with a constant rate of admission, you will eventually achieve a stable population. How do we know that? Well, because it's just like a hundred other different examples in the physical world. These are the inescapable mathematics of constant rates of discharge and constant rates of admission. When you couple them, you get a population. Physical analogy. Turn on the faucet, open the drain, turn, the, turn on the water. What will eventually happen if the tub is big enough? Eventually, the amount of water flowing into the tub will calibrate to the amount of water flowing out of the tub. And when you achieve that, what happens? It balances it out. It will achieve a steady level. That is exactly what happens in the child welfare system. If you have a stable rate of admission and a stable rate of discharge, you will have a stable population. <clears throat> now let's extend that. The main feature of reimbursement in the foster care world is cost per day. So let's set up a hypothetical. You have 1,000 children in care today, and each day of care costs a dollar. How much does it cost me today to run my child welfare system? $1,000. And if I don't let anybody in tomorrow or today, and I don't let anybody out tomorrow, and I have 1,000 kids at the start of the day tomorrow, what's it going to cost me tomorrow? thousand dollars and for the two days the total is two thousand dollars if I change the rate of admission what happens depends on the direction of the change let's say I reduce the rate of admission costs go down 
If I increase the rate of discharge, what happens? Costs go down. Do you see the link to outcomes? I can measure the number of kids in care on a day-to-day-to-day-to-day-to-day-to-day basis and calculate exactly the cost of providing foster care for that day, or I can accumulate it over a week, a month, a quarter, a half a year, a fiscal year, a calendar year, two years, three years, five years. If I know the admission and discharge rates, I know exactly how much money I'm going to be spending on foster care, provided I'm able to provide one additional piece of information. Actually, two additional pieces of information. Does anybody want to venture forth what that information is? Huh? No, no. I'm, I, need to, I, need to calculate the, I need to calculate the revenue, not how the revenue changes, but I need one piece of information. It's up on the screen. Rate per day. So if I have the rate per day, I have the admission rate and the discharge rate, what am I able to derive? Cost per unit time. And if I know what my programmatic changes are going to do relative to either what they do on the front door or on the back door, what am I able to articulate at that point? How a change in the rate of admission translates into reduced costs or increased costs, as the case may be. How a change in the rate of discharge up, slower rates of dis- uh, faster rates of discharge translates into a reduced draw on dollars. If, I, if the rate of discharge slows down, the population will drift up. And what happens when the population drifts up? Costs go up. So the fiscal challenge here is being able to estimate a rate of admission and estimate a rate of discharge. If I can do those two things, I have moved substantially closer to the possibility of managing money in the context of outcomes and outcomes in the context of money. Well, we haven't uh, haven't entertained that just yet. Uh, But it's a good question. If you didn't hear what um, your colleague had to offer, the cost of prevention has to be factored into here somewhere, as as well as the cost of exits, in-home services on either the front side, the front door, or the back door. But that's that's an investment question. Um, Just to uh, play with that a little bit, that's an investment question. If I buy $500 worth of preventive services, Right, and I want to pay for that investment in preventive services through a reduced utilization of foster care, I have to figure out the magnitude of the change in admission rates. You're talking about the front end of the system. What's the size of the change in the admission rate I have to generate in order to create the $500 in savings I need for the preventive service program? And is the $500 worth of preventive services program in fact enough Can you buy enough other stuff, to use a technical term? Can you buy enough other stuff so that you can generate the change in admission? That's the return on investment question. If I buy $500 worth of preventive services with the expectation that it's going to lower the rate of placement, I have to see the rate of placement and I have to see how it affects the utilization of days of care and the economic impact of those care days that have been shed from the system. That is the return on investment question. You can't get to that without going through these processes. So one other nuance to this and problematic from our perspective, is that admissions and discharges are often not steady. They go up and down from year to year. 
And some of that is just random fluctuation. Uh, so for example, if you admit a sibling group of five kids on the last day of the fiscal year, uh, they're going to show up on this year's fiscal year tally, as opposed to if they had waited, if the decision got made two days later, they would show up in the other fiscal year. And so there is some natural variation that takes place that has to be accounted for. But then there are also structural reasons why admissions go up and down. The one we're most worried about right now is the economy. The one that child welfare administrators around the country are singularly afraid of more than any other thing in conversations is drug epidemic. Because they race through communities doing tremendous damage to family capacity, and there's no possibility, uh, or there's limited possibility, limited perceived possibility, that that contagion can be uh, held in check. Sort of like the swine flu epidemic. They're worried about it catching on. And that's what, what people worry about in the drug epidemic. Methamphetamines right now uh, in rural parts of the country. How many people are worried about methamphetamines in their, in their part of the state. Why is that? Because it's a, it's a pulse that is directly related to the likely impact on admission rates and what will happen as a consequence. So they're not steady, and in fact, sometimes they are predictably going up or down, as the case may be. So as we think about the, the business we're in um, of... Um, linking outcomes and money. We have to be aware of that. That's actually where the risk is bundled in, is the fact that we're not running a steady state system, that it, you know, it isn't a faucet that you can regulate with, with a great deal of precision. There's a lot of risk involved, particularly on the admission side. Uh, and then another thing that can change that we have to take into account is the mix of cases uh, relative to unit cost. And by that I mean we could admit 100 kids this year and we may have admitted 100 kids last year. But if the 100 kids this year, if 75% of them use group care, and last year it was only 50 out of the 100, we have a completely different budget scenario. Why? Because the unit costs are different. And there may be clinical challenges that are associated with that mix in the, in the, in the mix of cases that we have to take into account that are related to outcomes. Kids go into group homes. Interestingly enough, uh, on length of stay, what happens if you, if you go from one year where you admit half your kids into group home and the next year you admit 75% of your kids into group home? What happens to length of stay? Goes down. Group care historically is a much shorter length of time in care than family-based care. So you get the benefit of a shorter length of stay, so to speak, in fiscal terms only. The problem is you got a huge unit cost change. So while you'll expect some quote unquote benefit, and again, I use that word loosely, uh, but the average length of stay associated with group home is gonna drive down the utilization on the number of days, but the fact that it's group, group care is gonna drive up the cost on a unit cost. So you might provide fewer days, but spend more money. That is a problem that fiscal directors are very concerned about uh, going forward. Um, and so you might have these case mix changes that relate to the type of kids that get in, how quickly they get out, and the unit costs associated with it. Those are details that have to be worked out, and uh, they can be worked out within the, uh, within the context of this model. So now what we want to do is we want to formalize the model. We want to say, what do we have to do to manage this system and link it to the outcomes? So uh, skip to the middle of the chart. Revenue or expenditure, depending upon what part of the budget cycle you're involved in. Some people think of it as revenue. Some people think of it as expenditures. Um, and in either event, or in any event, this is a standard 
model, any sort of basic MBA type would be able to tell you that the money you're going to spend this year or will have spent, if you're talking about the end of the year, is a function of the number of units you provided times the unit cost. It, it just, again, it couldn't be any simpler. If you can tell me the unit cost and the number of units, I can tell you how much you spend. If you give me the revenue and you give me the units, I can tell you what the average unit cost is. If you give me the revenue and the unit cost, I can tell you how many units you provided. It's two degrees of freedom. Uh, units are a function of admission and duration. How many kids did I let in and how long did they stay? Where are the outcomes in that construction? An admission rate per thousand measures how effective my preventive services are and duration measures how effective my expedited permanency functioning is. Uh, and then the unit cost, uh, and again the case mix is meaningful, uh, is the problem of meaningful variation in either the types of units, the unit costs, or differences in age or other attributes of kids that are related to admissions and discharges. But again that's a subtlety of the basic model um, all you need here to know is how many kids am I admitting and how many kids and how long are they staying. If I know that and I can change the admissions and I can change durations, I know exactly, subject to the precision with which I'm able to estimate that, I know exactly how much money I'm spending. And I know exactly how much money I won't spend if I reduce admissions and I know exactly how much money I won't spend if I increase discharges and there's no compensatory change in admissions. <laughs> I was wondering. <laughs> exactly. What other stuff? The other stuff like my son. The other stuff like uh, unit cost. So every Roll it into the unit cost. Every single service that is provided is a part of the unit cost. Uh, it, it, it is what you want it to be, but I can take your salary and roll it into the unit cost if I want to. And they do. Of course they do. Coming up with the unit cost may be complicated. The role of the unit cost in the equation is very simple. Give me the unit cost, and I will tell you how much it costs to run your system if you can give me the number of units you provide that are attached to that average cost. One of the big problems in the child welfare system is we do not do a very good job of costing our services. Allocating, you get, you know, that's part of the, that's part of the federal reimbursement formula. How many people do random moment surveys? Somebody in your county is doing random moment surveys, or somebody in the state is doing random moment surveys. Do you know what that is? It's time studies. Why do they do time studies? So that you can come up with a unit cost. It's not easy coming up with the unit cost, but once I have the unit cost, it's very simple. Etc. Etc. Is there a formula? No. No, because it's highly it's highly idiosyncratic. Do you have private agencies? Do you have public agencies? 
where do you get your mental health services in the system, out, out, you know, publicly or privately? There's a lot of calculations that go into it. It is not easy to come up with the unit cost services unless you want to do something relatively simple, which is tell me your revenue, tell me your units, and I will tell you what the average cost of the unit is. And usually that's how it's done. And there's nothing wrong with that. Yeah, so again, a fair point, but I'm not talking about how easy it is to calculate the unit cost. I'm talking about once you have the unit cost, what can it tell you about the change in revenue relative to a set of outcomes? There are all kinds of um, economic decisions that go into what, how one, you know, the cost of producing a unit of service may well depend on whether or not you're able to amortize the cost of administration over 20 workers or 500 workers because the cost of that infrastructure to support 20 workers may be the same cost as the 500 workers. So there's a lot of nuance and subtlety that goes into the question of what is the unit cost and coming up with an accurate calculation of that. That is by no means simple to do. So that is a fair point. But once I have that, uh, I know what to do with it in the context of revenue. And it's a fair question as to whether or not, at what level is there a diminishing return on the precision? So you can spend agonizing amounts of time getting the unit cost really precise, taking into account all manner of things along the lines of what you were just talking about. Where do you get this? What about transportation? What about this? What about that? All the things that go into producing a unit of service for a child in the child welfare system. You, again, you can go into agonizing detail about it. At some point, the next bit of detail, you have to evaluate whether or not that's actually producing a substantially better unit cost estimate. Right. It's not clear that, it's not clear that every next piece of information you add to your calculation of the unit cost improves the quality of the unit cost estimate substantially, given the work required to get that next piece of information. It's a cost-benefit question, and I think there are diminishing returns um, uh, related to it. So, um, but that's the basic, the basic question. And the issue here is there, there, um, there are outcomes tied to the unit cost, but basically volume and duration and admission and the relationship between those three is where the, is where the direct and unambiguous uh, relationship uh, resides. Well, uh, one of the interesting things from a strategy perspective, um, uh, when I've had this conversation with uh, healthcare providers, uh, and you look at the evolution of financial systems over time, fiscal and clinical systems over time, a lot of the attention is paid on managing admission and duration. How long do people spend in the hospital? How many people do you let into the hospital? But eventually, attention turns to managing the unit cost question. How can we produce the unit of service more efficiently with less cost? And where do, what, what are we talking about there? There we're talking about interventions. That's a programmatic decision. If I uh, if I implement structured decision-making, will that make me a more efficient provider of the decision-making capacity needed to govern admissions and discharges? And that might be a unit cost calculation that is uh, uh, observable in admission and discharge dynamics. But eventually, the question will come around to managing unit costs in addition to managing admissions and discharges. So when people talk about a simple example, when people talk about stepping down or preventing step ups, what are they doing? Managing unit costs in a particular way. That is stemming the flow of kids into residential care from family-based care. That's an admission strategy. That's slightly different than managing the unit cost, which is to say produce a unit of group care for lower amounts of money than it was costing previously. One way states do that is to implement a 5% rate cut. 
you were, you were getting $100 a day. You're now getting $95 a day. That is a crude form of unit cost management. typically implemented because people don't have faith that without that, that you can reduce costs through managing admissions and discharges. So you can see these things are all part of the fiscal program dialogue that are taking place each and every day. This is a conversation you're having or somebody in your organization is having each and every day. So part of what we're talking about here is making these explicit and fully participatory so that program and fiscal and policy folks are having the same conversation with the same set of expectations. So when we link outcomes to funding, it requires a model that dries off a detailed performance data that is longitudinal data. I already said that in, uh, in not so many words or actually more words than that, but it's worth coming back. You just, you simply cannot get um, a handle on managing the finances without the detailed longitudinal data. You also, again, to, it re repeats a point um, that I made earlier, but it just simply cannot be reinforced enough that when you start managing uh, admissions and discharges, the benefits are realized over different time horizons. Discharge manipulations will realize benefits over one time horizon. And by that I mean when will the, when will the effects hit the books? Admissions strategies will have their benefits realized over a different time horizon, at least potentially. And unit cost strategies will have a benefit over different time horizons. If, I, if you were in a fiscal crunch right now and you had the choice of changing admissions, changing discharges, or changing unit costs, and you needed to demonstrate a fiscal impact this year, which one of those three strategies would you choose in terms of its impact in the current fiscal year? Unit costs. Why? Because you're going to get the benefit right now. Which one is the least likely to produce benefits this fiscal year? Admissions. When people face a fiscal crisis, what's the first thing they try to do? Stem the flow of kids coming into foster care. They're, we're attracted to the thing that is least likely to deliver results in the time horizon we're facing. Not that we shouldn't be focused on prevention. Do not misunderstand me. What I'm saying is you're in a fight for resources. Understand when what you are going to do will achieve the benefits you expect it to deliver. Because it's going to tell you, if nothing else, when to look. If the benefits aren't going to come for two years from now, and you're looking six months from now, and somebody wants to know at six months, how are we doing on that, and there's no possibility that you would see a benefit at six months, why are you looking? Do you know how to say to the person, it's too soon, here's the demonstration of why it's too soon. We need to wait at least six months. It's a souffle. Don't open the oven door. Unless you want to see it disappear. If you don't know when it's going to hit the books, you are already working at a disadvantage. And we can't afford to work at those kinds of disadvantage. So this notion that the horizon, the time horizon in which effects will be observed is important. It differs by state and it differs by county within states. There are some places where uh, it's actually better to start working on admissions. So here's an exercise that you can go back to your county with to see whether or not 
you're an admission-dominated county or a discharge-dominated county. Go back to, uh, go to the Berkeley website, and you need two numbers. One is the number of kids in care at the start of a year. It could be a fiscal year, or it could be a calendar year. You just need the number of kids in care on a given day. And then you need to look at the number of kids admitted to care in the next year. And then you divide the number in care at the beginning of the year by the number admitted during the year. And if that number is big, then you have a discharge problem. If that number is small, you have an admission problem. Because it says, for every child I admitted during the year, or for every child I had in care at the beginning of the year, I admitted another child. That means they're coming and going very quickly, and you're matching your admissions to your stock. You're basically replacing kids on an annual basis. Your turnover is very high. If that number is very big, I've got three kids in care for every child I admit. Yes, Barbara? Oh, Two, three, right, right. It's undoubtedly going to be more than one because there are very few, very few systems that admit ki more kids in the year than they started the year with. But there are some systems, you know, I can think of one system where they admit, uh, they have a stock of kids in care at the beginning of the year of about 26,000 kids, and they admit 19,000 kids a year. That's a very small ratio as far as this system is concerned. There are other places that have 9,000 kids in care and they admit 1,500 kids. If they, you know, state A, you want to have a quick impact on the budget, stop letting so many kids in. State B, get the kids you started the year with already in care, out of care at some point during the next year. Of course, you won't get them all out, but if you accelerate the rate of discharge, it's going to hit the system this year. But that's just a simple, quick little number that you can go back and say, you know, we've got, a, we've got fiscal issues in our state, we've got fiscal issues in our county, should we be talking about strategies that are at the front door or the back door relative to this notion of horizon? At the end of the day, you're responsible for it all. You know, please don't misunderstand what I'm saying. It's about making calculated decisions with the understanding of the benefit being realized in a window of time that you need to understand, to be responsible about uh, your expectations and your ability to capture uh, the money. So the central questions in all of this is, when can you expect the impact of your changes? And how big is the expected impact? Because it's the only way you'll be able to manage the budget with safety of children in mind. If you say, I'd like to increase the rate of discharge by 10%, what does that mean? How many lives are we talking about influencing? You need to know the answer to that question. Are you talking about 500 lives, 200 lives, 25 lives? And do you have the resources to invest in what it takes to affect the number of lives you are by implication implicating? How many kids in the state of California for foster care system right now? Off the top, I mean, just give me a round number. 70,000? Yeah, just foster care. 80,000? So we ought to be able to say, if I increase the rate of discharge for that 80,000 kids, those are kids right now today. Let's, you know, we're not talking, that's the, that's, the, that's, the, that's the group we have. If we increase their rate of discharge by 10%, we ought to be able to estimate whether or not we're talking about 1,000 kids, 10,000 kids, because that's the effort then somebody's got to ask the clinical people, the program people, the policy people, do we know enough about what works to put that much of an expectation on our shoulders? 
That's the critical question. Barbara? Right, so you're about two to one. So you're in the mid-range of discharge dominated versus admission dominated statewide. So the counties will be in different positions with respect to that number. So you're at about, so for every child you have in care, you admit one. For every two children you have in care, you admit one. What's nice about it is that these problems of admission and discharge dynamics are very well understood from a research perspective. Demographers have been studying these issues for a long time. Biologists have been studying these issues for a long time. What is it that causes birth rates to rise and death rates to fall? What's the relationship between birth rates and death rates? What influences the comings and goings of people in populations? These are very well studied phenomenon, and we can borrow those tools from other disciplines, bring them into the child welfare world, and see how well they work. All right? So let's do that, I think. Familiar? Admissions, discharges, and then the square in the middle is the, is the population. In this particular case, the thing that we were modeling was residential care. Uh, and I'll just say a little bit about the policy application here because I think actually some, some counties in California are, are worried about this problem. A jurisdiction where we're working. They took a look at their residential care numbers and they say, we're, we're using too much residential care. Our question was, well, what do you mean? Do you let too many kids in or do they stay too long? They said they stay too long. So they said, well, let's, we're going to systematically reduce residential care duration. How many people here are trying to reduce time kids spend in residential care? It's as close to a universal problem as we get in the child welfare system. There is no, well, I shouldn't say there isn't anybody uh, looking to increase the time kids spend in residential care. The problem with residential care is that it's a fixed cost business. There's an interest on the part of providers to maintain utilization, which is a perfectly understandable problem uh, uh, that, that, that they face. Nothing, nothing wrong with acknowledging uh, a basic business uh, fact. The, um, the tension is, though, if you have a 90% utilization goal, I've got 100 beds, I'd like to keep 90 of them full on average, and I start to reduce length of stay, two things can happen. What are they? The beds are what? Beds are empty, so utilization falls below the target of 90%. Well, that's the third thing that could happen. They could raise their unit cost so they don't care as much about the 90% utilization level, so that is a possibility. I have one other thing in mind. Increase the rate of admission. All right, that, those, are the, those are the two compensatory behaviors, or the third one would be reduce the beds. Right? So all of the conversation that we have about what we're going to do, there are three compensatory behaviors that the providers and the state can get involved in. If you decide to reduce length of stay in residential care and you have a utilization goal, change the goal, change the costs, or increase admissions. There, that's all that can happen. That's when I say it's a simple system. How all of that goes, comes about 
That's where the complexity is. But it's all going to be channeled through those three levers. Right? So the, the issue is, over the time horizon, if I reduce length of stay in residential care, is that a, is that a light switch that somebody just turns on and says, oh, flip the switch, we're reducing length of stay today? It's not a light switch. It takes time to implement, to achieve success. So it's going to happen over a time horizon. Even if it was a light switch, it would take time to realize. The question is, how much time? When should you start looking for success? So we're going to run a little model that says, I've got some residential care here. I'm actually not going to constrain it by bed capacity. I've got admissions and I've got discharges into residential care. I'm going to hold constant admissions and discharges. And we're going to see what happens to the population. Then I'm going to change the rate of discharge. And we're going to see what happens to the population. Because that's the adaptive environment the residential care providers are going to live in. If you change my duration as a system, and I've got a constant rate of admissions, and I don't change admissions, what has to happen? Population is going to go down. So let's see if we can capture that. Okay. In case you needed verification that a constant rate of admission and a constant rate of discharge produce a stable population, we're running a model over three years. You see the line? And then we'll just fill it in here with one more line. Boom. Okay, so the blue line, labeled number one. Uh, actually, let's take uh, line, the top line, labeled two and three. Um, all of the lines are designed to demonstrate the fact that if you have a constant rate of admission and a constant rate of discharge, and just uh, in the background here, what we've got are we're generating uh, a constant rate. We talked about the fact that a rate per thousand so what we've got here is a rate per thousand, and then we're throwing in a little bit of random fluctuation so that on average, the rate comes out to a constant rate, but it, um, it isn't the same at each unit of time. Uh, but given a constant rate of admission and a constant rate of discharge, we start the population with no kids in the system, and it rises to a point, slowly uh, starts off growing very quickly, slows down, and then uh, from a point at about uh, roughly one year, the population is stable there uh, from that point forward. And the area under that curve, if I were to say, well, on day one there was nobody in care, it didn't cost me anything. On day one there were five kids in care, it cost me five times the unit cost. On day two there were so many kids in care, so on and so forth. The area under the curve is total money. That's the entire, that's a, that's, a, that's a visual representation of the rate at which the system is spending money. Out here at the end, when we have roughly, oh, you know, uh, it's half the distance there, 500 days, roughly 450, there's 450 kids in the system on a given day. That means it's costing me 450 times the unit cost uh, uh, for each and every one of those uh, days. Uh, so the area, if you just imagine the area under the, gar under the graph is money. Uh, care days uh, times, that's the volume question. We admitted some kids in, they stayed a certain amount of time, and that was uh, the total volume of days used. That's where the volume is. Uh, on that second line, uh, uh, number one, uh, uh, the lowest line there, um, that is a constant rate of admission matched to a lower, uh, I'm sorry, a faster rate of discharge. And the result of that is that you have a smaller population. You let just as many kids in, but they have a shorter duration. The result of that is a smaller population. These are the kinds of manipulations that when we talk about addressing the concerns in the child welfare system, we're talking about reducing lengths of stay, 
or increasing the rate of admission, depending upon how you want, what kind of language you want to use. The expectation is that if you, if you operate at a constant rate of admission, the population has to get smaller. There's no if, ands, or buts about it. It's like musical chairs. If there's 30 people and 28 chairs, when the music stops, somebody's not sitting down. It's the same thing here. You cannot escape the mathematics here. It's true of every population known to science. So take advantage of it. The line that's labeled number two is what happens if we have one rate of discharge and then suddenly decide we got to get them out faster and we change the rate of a discharge. We accelerate the rate of discharge. What happens is, and in this particular case, we're just resetting the rate of discharge to the other example. And what eventually happens is that the population settles down to the equilibrium consistent with that rate of discharge and that rate of admission. That rate of admission and that rate of discharge will always come out to the same point. And if you have one rate of discharge and another rate of admission and you change them, it will settle back down to where uh, it was as though that was always true. Follow that? The curious thing about this is that it takes, these, are, these happen to be incremented in days. It takes in excess of 180 days for this population to settle down, to re-find its equilibrium. And I did something we can't as a system do, which is to flip the switch and say, as of this day, the rate of discharge is different. That's not the world we operate in. It takes time to implement change. But even in the world in which we exist, where it is possible, or in a simulated world, where it is possible to flip a switch and say, as of this day, we're getting kids out faster, no matter what, it still takes 180 days which is 50% of the observed time, for the full benefit of the outcome to be realized. You can't accelerate the process. There's nothing you can do about it. There's zero degrees of freedom when it comes to doing a better job. You want to do a better job? You want to get the outcome faster? You need a bigger change in the rate of discharge. It's impossible. So, if you're looking at 400 days for the full benefit of those changes, will you find it? No. So when the folks come to you and say, how are we doing, are we there yet? You have to be able to say, we're on our way, we're on target, but we're not there, and if we remain on target, we will get there in about another, whatever it happens to be, six months, a year. That's the notion of the time horizon. We could go through here and we could say, okay, let's change the rate of admission and do a comparison and say, at what point will we realize that the population has settled down at its new level? And we can combine the two effects, an admission uh, change in the admission rate and a change in the discharge rate, and see how that compares to our base model. But at the end of the day, the mathematics will be inescapable. And you have to live with that. Now, the nice thing about this from a linking the outcomes and a finance perspective is that the difference between those lines is pardon? Think about what I said a moment ago. Dollar savings to the penny. Four-E waiver. This is the game you're playing with the four-E waiver. 
you're betting that you can reduce the rate of admission, increase the rate of discharge, create the space between the lines, and hold on to the money. It's what's true about a block grant. With a block grant, you're saying, I will give you the money equivalent to the value of the top line. If you manage to serve fewer of those kids, that is, if you manage to achieve utilization at the lower line, line number one, you don't have to worry about the overage. If you start off in a block grant, and historically you're spending at a rate, let's just look out at 300, out from zero to 365 days. If I look out and, I'm, and I, I took an amount in a block grant equivalent to the money reflected under the curve number one, and I start the next year off, and I'm spending at a rate equivalent to the line two, three, would that be a good situation or a bad situation? Bad situation. Why? Because I'm spending money at a rate measured in days used that is in excess of the amount of money used to seed the value of the block grant. That's the risk. The risk is that you can't manage admissions and you can't manage discharges in a, in a way that is consistent with the value of the baseline uh, revenue allocation. That's why the assumptions in this baseline revenue allocation are so important. A lot of people want to do this on the basis of claims. Not a good idea. You want to do it on the basis of care days. Why would care days be a better way to do it? Because it's, care days are a direct function of admissions and discharges. That is a direct and unambiguous link to the outcomes. If you want to project the demand for foster care next year, do not project the, the claims. You'll know the claims once you have the days. But if you have the claims, you may not know the days. Why? Because you're allowed to claim 18 months in arrears. I can submit a claim this year for expenses I paid out last year or 18 months ago. At least that was the federal rule. I don't know what it is in terms of the state. But the claims you pay out this year may be attached to care days you delivered more than a year ago. It's hard for a child to be in foster care this year and have that day occur 18 months ago. It may be the same child, but it's going to be a different day. You need to know those days because you need to know when to look for the benefit. You look for the benefit by following the days, not by following the claims. Again, if you have the days, you automatically have the claims, but it doesn't work the other way around. Does that make sense to folks? When you hear the federal dialogue taking place around you know, current financial financial reform, you'll hear them say, well, what we're going to do is we're going to roll up claims for five years. When you hear that, I hope that you will remember this conversation and say, that's not really a very smart way to do it because you've broken the link between the money and the outcomes. And you cannot manage this problem if that link has been severed. It has to remain direct and unambiguous. So, time horizon. I flipped the switch, I changed uh, outcomes, and it took 18 months, not 18 months, 180 days, roughly, to achieve the new population level connected. That's, that's again, that goes back to the time horizon and when can you expect to see the benefits of a particular change. Very important to understanding. Um, if you were to imagine this as fiscal years, right? Well, you get a big bump in the first fiscal year, but it diminishes later on. But the, excuse me, the savings, I'm sorry, it's, it, it's the area above two and three. 
Initially, the savings are not very great. But over time, the savings grow. And they continue out to 730 days. Well, this is two fiscal years here. At the end of the one fiscal year, I've implemented a change. And I don't get very much of that benefit in the first month, the second month, the third month. But when I get out to the 8th, 9th, 10th, 11th, and 12th month is when I realize the benefits of the savings. That's going to continue on into the next fiscal year, into the fiscal year after that, the fiscal year after that. You have to ask yourself the question, am I willing to forego those out-year savings? And if not, how do I get them? How do I identify them, preserve them for the investments I'm going to need to make in order to maintain the lower rate of admission and the higher rate of discharge? Um, I had a thought there. It has escaped me. Um, any questions about this so far? It'll come back to me. No problem. That's why you're here. Um, of course it comes up. So what about the kids? Well, um, what's in their best interest if they stay in care longer than they need to be? Oh, I'm not, uh, I think, I think um, if that's a conclusion you're reaching as a result of my comments, then let me be clear about that. Um, I am looking for the fiscal implications of my changes to outcomes for children and families. I am not looking to gener I'm not looking for fiscal changes to drive outcomes for kids. It's a very important, it's a very important distinction. And if I haven't made myself clear, then I've neglected my responsibility. So let me find this file, and then we'll, we'll, um, we'll, address, that, um, we'll address that issue. <clears throat> um, we go about trying to manipulate, change, alter, improve, whatever, word, whatever language you want to use, uh, improve outcomes for kids. And that's extend through quality services, um, do a better job of serving kids. Well, what does that mean? Well, kids and families, my, my proposition would be kids and families should get the services they need when they need them, in the amount they need them, so long as they need them. So, uh, how, do we, how do we accomplish that? How do we get kids the services they need? All of child welfare uh, reform is predicated on the idea that we do not accomplish that. That we use foster care when we could use other things to better meet their needs. We keep kids in foster care longer than they need to be given their needs because we don't have alternatives in the community. We need to do a better job of that. Every system needs to ask the question, how inefficient are we? What, to what extent do we fail that test? If you're not failing that test, if you're running on all eight cylinders or 12 cylinders, you're doing the best job that you can. There's no need to entertain fiscal reform because you won't get anything for it because there's no inefficiency. But if you're operating an inefficient system, if you're a state where you have a 28-month length of stay and the national average is 12 months, it's a good bet that there's some inefficiency. And if you don't directly address that, then I, my question back would be, what about the kids? Those kids are being kicked to the curb. So we're going to set about increasing rates of permanency for those kids. Let's use a more user-friendly term. We're going to increase rates of permanency for kids. If we don't 
recognize that that action has fiscal consequences that are at the detriment of the system, we're kidding ourselves. So rather than have a conversation as though practice changes are not intimately related to fiscal dynamics, let's make it all explicit so that where there's opportunity to take advantage of investments, converting foster care dollars into in-home and community-based services, we ought to be doing that. I oftentimes hear proposals where we want to increase our investments in preventive, community-based preventive services by $50 million. Good. Go ahead and do that. Because at the very least, what you'll do is you'll stop the bleeding on the foster care side. But if you want to have a real impact, hold on to the foster care dollars, that $50 million is going to save you, and put the two, month, two, two dollars together. Because if all you're doing is putting the $50 million on the table, it's likely that all that's doing is slowing the rate at which expenditures on children and families in the child welfare system is shrinking. We don't want to be in the business of a controlled shrinkage unless it's because there's no more need for services. But we're not looking to serve those kids. Uh, we're not looking to move the service location from foster care to the community because we, don't, because we think those kids don't have needs anymore. It's because we think we can meet those needs better in the community. But in making that choice, we're foregoing the foster care dollars. Why? So we're, the, the why is because those are the rules. Well, why are those the rules? Because somebody's trying to protect the risks. Let's get out of that dynamic and into one that's more productive because the current system has already kicked the kids to the side of the curb. Right? And it, again, we're, we're, we don't do ourselves any good by not understanding the fiscal dynamics. Again, a $50 million, in most child welfare systems, you'd be lucky to get a $50 million increase in your preventive services. That's working hard in good fiscal times to get a $50 million increase in preventive services. If that investment is half as good as people say it is, it's likely to in, in, um, reduce the demand for foster care by $200 million. Would you rather have the $50 million or the $200 million? Or would you like to have it both? I want it all for the system, for the kids in our system. There's no sense giving it back. We're still serving kids. They still need the services. We're just doing it in the community. Why give it back? So that's, but as program people, if we don't take command of that decision making and understand the fiscal, compli uh, the fiscal implications of what we're preaching for and, and, and praying for every day, we're not doing a full service job. That's the, that's the point here. Okay, so, I just want to, these are really good questions. So, you know, by all means, um, if you have questions, I'm just going to do one little last bit of exercise and then, um, and then take some more questions. But we're sort of running um, uh, up against the, uh, the end of our time together. So, and again, I'm sort of, actually, it's not so bad on your screen. And I won't bore you with the details of what's going on behind here. People who were at the advanced analytics last week will remember this from the thing we called uh, extreme forecasting. Um, but uh, essentially what we're trying to do here, measuring in kid terms and in uh, expenditures. Expenditures to the uh, left, your left, uh, fiscal terms, um, children, children in care uh, on the uh, on your right. Uh, and what these are, these are five-year projections. And what we've done is embedded in here uh, the handful of things that we actually have control of, where the outcomes uh, are linked to the money. So basically what we're doing here is we're saying, what would happen if we changed intake? What would happen if we changed discharge rates? What, happen, what would happen if we changed um, uh, unit costs? That is to say, the actual cost of producing a unit, a group care, let's say. Or uh, what happens if we shifted the mix of uh, the fraction of kids who utilize group care? 
That is, we try to increase the rate at which kids don't go into group care or we increase the rate at which they're stepped down because uh, all of that goes into the cost calculation. Uh, the top line, which um, actually in this scenario is, is there's two lines behind that, but that one will stay where it is. Uh, that's the baseline. That is what would happen if nothing changed. Uh, that's our, that's our, you know, our baseline, our equilibrium. The yellow line for interests perspective is the admission strategy. That is, what, happens if, what would happen if we, incre if we decrease the rate of admission by 10%? So you can see that um, uh, it uh, actually changes the number of kids in care over time, uh, and it has a fairly substantial change in uh, total expenditures there on the right, uh, on, on your left, right? It's the difference between those two lines. And it's a five-year projection, 06 to 2010. This is uh, some models that we were working with some time ago. So what would happen uh, if I uh, discharged, uh, if I increased the rate of discharge for the kids that I started the six-year window or the five-year window who are already in care? That is, I'm not worrying about how long the kids I'm going to newly admit. I'm just going to worry about the kids who are in care at the beginning of the five-year period, and I'm going to increase their rate of discharge by 15%. Uh, Oops. This is what I mean when I say we have to understand the time horizon. Uh, if we look at expenditures, you can see that initially the discharge strategy has a greater impact than the admission strategy. But that over time, that wears off. How do we know that? Because in, 19, in, 2000, in, in calendar year 2008, the middle point, they're roughly at about the same point. That means they're, they're, the expenditures associated with those changes on the, you know, relative to the population as a whole the benefit is about the same in terms of reduced expenditures. But to the left of time, the benefits are greater for the admission strategy, uh, for the discharge strategy. Over time, the, the admission strategy pays off uh, larger benefits. And in fact, expenditures uh, start to rise because of um, things going on inside the group care aspect of the system. So we have more kids using group care, so it starts to go up. Expenditures actually start to go up. When we look at children in care, you can see that the discharge strategy has a longer benefit. Kids keep going down, and it isn't until the fourth year that we actually see the two populations converge in terms of their net effects. This is what I mean when I say you have to consider the time horizon when looking at the relationship between outcomes and finances. Things happen in different time frames. Uh, what would happen if I change uh, the mix of group care utilization? So I'm going to go back and set this to one. And I'm going to increase the likelihood that a kid... Uh, we'll go into group care. This is a nice little illustration. Costs go way down. What about the population? It actually starts to go up. We talked about this earlier, I think. Do you know why it starts to go up? Why the po costs are going down, but the population is going up. Mm, I think I know what you said. Group home care is more effective at reunification. You're on to it. 
When we shift utilization to group care, we're not shifting kids out of the system. We're shifting them from group care to foster care. We're not stepping them up or we're stepping them down, one or the other. But they're in foster care. What do we know about foster care? Lengths of stay are longer in foster care. So if we're increasing the rate of utilization of foster care, kids slow down the discharge dynamic the kids slow down because they're associated with a type of care that has associated with it longer lengths of stay. What happens as a result of that? The population, so if you're, looking, if you're looking at the benefit of this strategy in terms of reductions in the population, are you looking in the right place? No. It doesn't change a lot you look over here at the children in care, but it doesn't change at all initially, and eventually the population actually starts to grow. The point being that some of these changes that you're contemplating will cause some of the measures you use to assess success to go in a direction that seems contrary to the path success would take you down. This is a conversation you need to have with people when you're A, planning a project and B, looking to see whether or not it had the effect that you were looking for it to have. People will say, I'm delighted by the change in expenditures, but I am puzzled by why my population isn't going down. And it's actually a very logical outcome connected to the changes that you made. You have to be able to have that conversation. Um, we'll go through one more of these. Um, you got the admission. Um, we'll set this back to zero. Um, working the backlog. Um, uh, this was a 1.1%, I think. Oops, I'm sorry. Oh, well, let's just take a look at that. Um, that's what happens if I increase admissions by 10%. That, that the pink line now at the top. You can see how that, uh, you know, that's the sort of thing. That's, that's, you know, if your baseline is the blue number, is the blue line, and you increase the rate of admissions by 10%, that's what happens on the expenditure side, that's what happens on the population, excuse me, population side. That is not a, that is not a pretty picture from a, from a block grant perspective. That's why people are so frightened of these changes in the demand for foster care that, that are hard to anticipate. There's a lot of vulnerability there. That is exactly why. If we were to do what I had intended to do, which was to impose a 90% change on the rate of admission. Um, so let me just do something here and see what, um, yeah, that's, so that's the 5% change, and then the 10% the change is there. And there again, you can see that the, the programmatic question is, how do I achieve changes in the rate of admission consistent with a 10% reduction. And what's the magnitude of kids we're talking about? We're talking about going from, oh, roughly, say, 17,300 down to 15,000 over time, 2,300 kids. What is it going to take to do that from a service investment? These are real kids' lives. Don't say we can do 10% and have no clue about the quality of what you're going to do and how much of it you have to do in order to achieve a 10% reduction in, in, in the rate of admission. You're going to have to buy something else for those kids. What is it? Who are you talking to about the, the likelihood that that's going to happen? How do you achieve those decisions? I think you're actually doing a disservice to those kids that you're talking about if you don't understand the financial implications because somebody's got to say, you know, that's more, that's more benefit out of that bundle of services than we have reason to expect. Because, you know, let's say 
let's do parenting classes. I'm sure that we, with, with, if we buy more parenting classes, we can reduce the demand for foster care such that we'll achieve a 10% reduction in admission. Then I want to know is, well, what parenting classes are you going to buy? Because if you're buying the stuff that most child welfare systems are providing, you're not going to get a 10% reduction in admissions. Because most of the parenting services people are buying aren't worth anything when it comes to real measurable changes in the demand for foster care. They're nice to have parents go to, but as far as changing behavior is concerned, I don't think so. So you have to say whether or not that purchase in and of itself of the sorts of things people have on their minds as parenting classes, will that achieve that reduction? If not, do not make that promise. So, you know, just to go back over, uh, these are absolutely the most important conversations to have in child welfare. What are you doing about the money? How does the money shape the system? The money supports the supply of services. The supply of services dictates what you're actually able to provide. If you do not have a residential care bed, available, to what extent does it matter how bad that child needs that service? Tough to get somebody into a bed that doesn't exist. So to the extent that the financial system supports a structure that constrains your opportunity to make choices based on the needs of children and families, then to change the choices, you have to change the money. And that is the path forward as far as child welfare reform is concerned. So thanks for your time and attention. <clears throat>